Saints. We're going to build the best football program in the SEC Conference. You have now arrived at Stadium in Bear. The kick, it's been blocked! Boys and girls, ladies and gents, welcome to another episode of Stadium Miguel. It's your favorite Uncle Silk. It's Dan. And Del Torre. Same corner, same time. How y'all feeling? We're in the thick of summer, man. Super hot outside. Buddy, it is It is hot out there. I don't mm. feel like we we eased into anything this year, Silk. So. Nah, dropped off a cliff. A we bit. just dropped right off a cliff. It's about to be... Uh, the hurricane season soon. It's about to be uh, extra deodorant weather here soon. Uh, right. But the vibes are still heavy. Um, great weekend. Great weekend. Nick, I watched your favorite pastime this weekend. Watch the Rays play mm. at probably the most magnificent park <laughs> in all of baseball. That park deserves to be in Duval County. <laughs> Whoa, y'all starting all hot today, boy. Actually, uh, Duval has a beautiful minor league baseball park. Um Something that Tampa, St. Pete, who knows where that stadium is? Clearwater, uh, all the same. St. Pete, yeah. Orlando's about to have a new baseball team, man. Well, that complex, I, I told you guys in the group chat, that complex looks suspect. Suspect? I don't know, man. Suspect. I think Dan would just said a suspect uh, 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 facility, but Orlando <laughs> got some dreams and some things Trop- going on out there. I'm, I'm a Tropicana, free agent right now. Tropicana Field is a cement trash can. It is. It is. Um, it, you know what it team, reminds me? The team, incredibly fun. Yeah. They built that organization. Great no baseball doubt. team. Lots of um, home runs. They're they're fun. Great pitching. Um, would love to see them stay healthy. They've got an incredible pitching staff. They unfortunately play in the second worst stadium in Major League Baseball. Behind, Only to be outdone by won. the Coliseum. The Coliseum out uh, the the Oakland A's. A's. Aren't but they the, moving, they, they're the going to be moving to uh, Vegas, Vegas, right? <clears throat> yeah, so they haven't been. They've been trying to get a new stadium because uh, that's the last. I mean, the obviously the Raiders are in Las Vegas, but that was the last dual purpose stadium in in existence, mm. or that was being used as a dual purpose stadium before the Raiders moved. Um, it's just a terrible stadium. It's f- literally falling apart. You can go online, you see pictures. Uh, seats are broken, rusted. Looks like a gross stadium. Fortunately, there's they, no one there to sit in them, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that team's that team's atrocious. The A's are terrible. Um, I think if you put together a group of current Florida Gators in the major leagues, they could beat the Oakland Athletics. Very good. Gators are doing well right now in, in Major League Baseball. I won't say that I follow it a lot um, as a lifelong Marlins fan. You know, I'll root on their Rays here, living here, but as a lifelong Marlins fan, it's – it's always tough to follow baseball on a year in and year out basis. Yeah, no rip doubt. your heart out, Dan. No, rip, rip your heart, heart out. out. That's right. We, we got a couple World Series series, so that's all that matters. But we got a a, a big show ahead of us today. Andy Staples uh, is joining us uh, from the Athletic, frequent guest uh, to the show. But uh, before he joins, uh, let's give a shout out to our friends at Allen Horn Insurance. So if you are looking for an insurance provider for any of your needs, whether it be renter's insurance, homeowner's insurance, business insurance, uh, boat insurance, whatever it might be, give Allen a call at 706-692-2888 or visit him at allenhorninsurance.com in Georgia, Florida, Alabama, or Tennessee. Again, Allen Horn Insurance with State Farm, Speaking of former Florida Gator greats in baseball, Allen Horn Insurance. Again, 706-692-2888. Uh, 
And without any further delay, a couple minutes early, Andy Staples is going to join us. Andy, my friend, how are you? How are you doing, guys? It's good to see you again. Hanging out, Andy. How's it going, my dude? Good. I love the locker room silk. This is not – why don't you get to sit in the lazy boy? Why you got to sit in a regular chair? I don't want to get too comfortable, mm -hmm. Andy. If I get too comfortable, I might not finish the show, man. So I got to be about business. So how you doing? You always got the beautiful backdrop right there. Got your, your jersey hanging up in there. It was never worn in a game because <laughs> – It's clean. It hey. it's clean. Very, well, that the game it was made for was on AstroTurf, so it would have actually stayed clean. Mm -hmm. But no, it's it's – you have to actually be good at football, and and I was not. So, mm. yeah, my, my job was to let people throw me around like a ragdoll. Uh, all American at that. I was great at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, well, Andy, we appreciate you uh, you coming on to the show again. Uh, good timing. Uh, last week uh, today, uh, you released an article about called how a once dominant college football program fell permanently two steps behind um andy I, I know a lot of people have read this it looks like a lot of people on the athletic read it 240 comments i'm sure the comment section is just full of Very nice. good common uh just positive affirmation yeah Actually, positive we, affirmation we discussion. really really good comment section at the athletic for the most part like it company it's man it's healthy yeah no, healthy nah. debate robust yeah. it's, it's not mm. bad i I, I'm one of those, you know, I was always a don't read the comments person, but since I've been at The Athletic, I, I actually do read the comments. And it, it was interesting because they kind of split a couple of ways. Like, you know, people who aren't Florida fans were like, okay, cool, thanks for telling us all this. And then the Florida fans were like, I wish you'd gone a little deeper. And the thing was, I mean, it, it was hard to kind of balance the two because you could write a book on how they got where they are now from when Urban left. Well, Andy, we have some time. Um, <laughs> let's write let's, that book now. Let, so, so I think, you know, a, a lot of what the internet was saying about this article is that if you are a diehard fan, none of this stuff is surprising, right? You've right. heard all of this stuff. Yes. But if we were to dive into kind of a few of the biggest issues at hand, you know, was it Florida's approach that was lacking? Was it the lack of desire to really go into debt for a long time? You know, they really wanted to raise all of that money early on. What would you say are, are probably the two or three most important uh, pieces that you feel, you know, in your research conversations, and everything else of why Florida did fall uh, behind? I, I think it was approach for a long time. You think it, 20 years worth of, we don't need all those fancy facilities. And it's basically, you know, Coach Spurrier saying that, and then everybody in charge believing that for, for so long, even after Spurrier had gone on South Carolina and be like, no, 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 facilities matter. That That's a big deal. And so that part, and, and you mentioned the debt, that they were tr always very fiscally cautious, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But it also kind of underscored that, that Florida is not like, say, Texas or Texas A&M, where if you need some money, you just go say, we're, we're raising money. Come donate to us. Like you got to work at Florida to get folks to, to write big checks. Uh, the same people tend to get hit up over and over again. And that doesn't, I mean, Gary Condren is a great guy. He's awesome. And I, I would feel so bad having to just go to him again and again and again every time something happened or uh, to, you know, Gil Limran's a little bit older, but, but he was that guy for a little while. And yeah, I think more other schools have a few more of those folks that they can kind of spread things around with. I, I was talking to somebody from Texas A&M the other day and they said, generally there's about 20 people who can stroke the kind of check that makes something happen. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Florida's at that number, you know, and I don't think there's a lot of schools at that number, but um you know, it's it's hard when you don't have as as robust of a donor base. And so that's one thing Scott Strickland was hired for was he was a very good fundraiser at Mississippi State. And Mississippi State doesn't have the donor base that Florida does. But he, you know, worked and got a, a football building built there and and had stadium improvements done and all that. So the idea was he'd come in and be able to raise more money at Florida. And he's had to, you mm -hmm. know. Remember, to build the Heavener Center, well, they were going to build it differently. And then Strickland, right kind of at the last moment, said, you know, can we postpone this a little bit 
move the baseball stadium and then build it the way we really want to build it. Because that and, started with McElwain, and that, mm-hmm. that was going to be like a three-story facility yep. over in the corner by this, I think that's Second Street, and you weren't yep. going to change anything, and that building was disjointed, and you were going to yep. have a weight room here and half a locker room here, and then the showers and the coach's office. It, it was going to be a mess. It reminds me of this house I looked at last time we were looking <laughs> for a new house where I walked in, and the, the, the master bedroom was right next to the kitchen, and the kitchen was tiny. And it had this giant long hallway that didn't seem to do anything. Just <laughs> like took up. in New York City. <laughs> this was in this was in Newberry, Florida, yeah. <laughs> and it was it was weird. I was like, "What? Who built this?" Like, what's going- <laughs> that's that's exactly what they were. Nick, your 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 point is correct. Like, they were looking at it and going, "Well, this is not that efficient." And the whole idea of this building is to create a more efficient environment. So that they changed that. They had to raise more money. It took longer and. That's that's why it took until 2020, what, 2022 to have it open. And so, I, I mean, that's part of it. I think other parts of it, just decision making. And, and it's not always the administration's decision making. Sometimes it's, it's coaches decision making. Sometimes it's, it's weird things have happened. I mean, so I, I, there's so many little moments as you go through post Urban Meyer, Florida, you know, what if Will Muschamp came in and instead of saying you got to be able to fit the power to beat the University of Florida, had said, I'm going to go with some of these new offenses mm-hmm. that are driving me nuts as a defensive coordinator. And he doesn't hire Charlie Weiss. And he hires somebody who's a little more forward thinking offensively. Like Brent Peace. Not Brent Peace. <laughs> but the like Kurt Roper. <laughs> Not Kurt Roper. Well, maybe oh, okay. Kurt Roper. Maybe Kurt Roper from day one would have been okay. Yeah. But, but somebody, you know, in that vein. But he wasn't going to do it. But but if he'd done that, he might still be the coach at Florida. You know, if, if Jim McElwain, when when Will Greer gets suspended, if Jim McElwain says, "We want you still here," because remember that that whole situation, it's it was it seemed to me it was fairly mutual that both parties agreed that Will would do better off somewhere else. What if the coaching staff had said, no, 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 we want you to stay here. Mm-hmm. We want you to be the quarterback here. And when you come back after game six next year, we're good. Yeah, I, um, I, I really think, you know, Florida has had obviously a lot of things in their control that they were behind on, right? Facilities, some of these recruiting staffs and yep. extra. Yeah, the staffing know, thing's another so- money yeah. you know, allocation thing that – that we haven't talked about, but Will Muschamp got told no on that. Jim McElwain got told no on that. Napier's the first one that's gotten like a full yes. Yeah. And you, you start to look at it, right? You have the Will Greer situation. You have the credit card scandal. You have a lot of things that are just like these once in a generation type of incidents has happened. You wonder, like you wonder once why all this gray hair, staff, Dan, huh? Right. Yeah. Nick, Nick had a uh, black hair. When I remember the I had, I had jet black hair when I was a young, fresh eyed journalist starting on this beat, you know, but you, but you Working think down. about, you know, after urban Meyer leaves, Will Muschamp is the coach in waiting at Texas, probably the hottest assistant coach in college football. Um, you know, Jim McElwain, maybe not the, the right fit culturally, but doing really well at Colorado state comes from under uh, Nick Saban before that is recruiting pretty well before he gets fired. Could have had a probably an amazing recruiting class. We'll never know what that could have yeah, been. Jamar Chase and then Dan, say what? It's Jamar, Jamar Chase. Chase. Yeah. <laughs> like before Kyle Jim, Pitts, Mac- I mean, before Jim McElwain imploded, they were going to get Matt Corral, Jamar Chase, and probably Kyle Pitts. Um, yeah. They, I mean, I, they, they had Kyle Pitts in the boat. So yeah, yeah they, right? they were going to have Matt Corral and the chase. I, the LSU people say they would have gotten Chase all along, but Chase- May, and maybe so. But you yeah. know, there was there was a lot of other names who that names are escaping me right now. And then Dan Mullen, a guy that brought Mississippi State to number one, comes back to Florida. It doesn't work out. It's all of these kind of weird situations where you're like, oh, that should have worked. Well, if that didn't work, then this should have. Well, if that doesn't, then bring Dan Mullen home. That should work. And now we find ourselves in a situation where Florida has two six one seasons in a row. I think they'll be probably pretty lucky to get more than, than six or seven this year. You know, how much of it is what Florida could have done versus how much of just what happened in, in Florida, you just have to be able to deal with adversity and overcome. Well, the Mullen thing is so weird because that's, that's when I, 
I have a hard time pinning on on the administration, other than maybe saying, "Hey, look, there's a better, there's a higher standard you have to recruit to." Mm-hmm. But the coach being good and successful, and then changing his mind about what he wanted all of this to be, and deciding, "I want to be an NFL coach," I don't know that you can control that. Mm-hmm. So. That that's the strangest thing is is that's another it's another kind of weird Florida thing like, yeah, COVID happens, Dan Mullen mentally becomes a different person, and all of a sudden you're in a weird spot. Now, the thing is, how would the Dan Mullen tenure have worked out had he not suddenly decided he wanted to be an NFL coach? I don't know that it changes the the end result because ultimately they were still going to have this massive talent gap with Georgia. Right. Or with LSU once Brian Kelly got there. And I think they were still going to have the same problems. But, you know, it, it, it's yet another thing that that w- it's it's so hard to explain because it feels like other programs don't have this sort of weirdness happening to them over and over and over again. I want to ask you uh, back to like the, the, the donors and, you know, the boosters. What's normally the culture of the programs that do have a lot of boosters and um, donators uh, when it pertains to football control? A lot of people that donate money may want some say so. Yeah. Depending on what they're uh, they're giving. So what's normally the culture around college football and boosters and donating and all that? It depends on the place. So like Texas has been one over the years where people feel like I give this much money. I therefore deserve a say in things. And it's it's caused problems and it. It's even they're trying to deal with their NIL situation because they don't want anybody going rogue in the NIL space because they want to make sure they have a a unified philosophy. But that's that's stuff they've worried about. But then you've got Ohio State where Gene Smith very much in control is the AD. They have tons of big donors, but they almost counterbalance each other where, you know, Gene is like, I'm in charge. Keep giving us money. Trust us that it'll work. And they keep delivering a product that works. And that's what you want. And now Florida, for the for the most part, has always had a situation where the AD's been in charge. The donors have not had outsized influence on it. And then the thing is, like, I don't I I, I imagine y'all have met Gary Condren, who's who's Florida's mm-hmm. biggest donor at the moment. Gary is not the kind of guy who's gonna go in demanding things. Uh, you must do this. I, I, I fire this. He's not that guy. He just wants Florida to be good. And he trusts the people in charge to, to make that happen. And you want people like that. You want a lot of people like that. The problem is Florida doesn't have a lot of people like that because they, they don't have a lot of people who are willing to, to donate at that level. Alabama has more. Georgia has more. Texas has a ton, but they want a medal. Texas A&M has a ton. They used to meddle more and don't meddle as much. Auburn, Texas Auburn A&M's big meddlers. Problems, Texas A&M's problems feel more like in the football office than, <laughs> than outside. What do you mean? You mean a coach with a King's ransom who can just kick his feet up on the desk and say, please fire me? That would be that would be an issue. That would be an issue. I would love to get fired if I were Jimbo Fisher. No I would do everything, doubt. everything in my power. There, there's no offset to that. So, like, imagine he he gets fired after this season and collects like seventy six million dollars, and then becomes West Virginia's coach. Right, <laughs> like double dipping. Just gets to go home. He, he can so, literally buy half the Appalachian Mountains. So what, what we see with college football is today is it's pretty much a, a, a money game. Mm-hmm. Um, we see what Bam was spending. We seen what uh, the uptick in Georgia's always spent well, but we seen the uptick when Kirby got the job. You can see the money being spent everywhere. Um, we could come up with a, a lot of things. We talked about the coaches and you know uh, some of the, the, the ones they wanted with staff size um, that they didn't get, but a lot of it just comes down to money. How does Florida fix that money problem? Well, you got to keep trying to find more big donors, but I don't think Florida has a huge money problem because they, they, they have a decent enough donor base. They have a big stadium that they tend to fill. They have the SEC TV contract, which is about to pump in some more money. So I, I actually think they're fine on that front. Spending like, it. They are spending it. And, yeah. and, and in fact, 
they, they might have to rein in the spending a little bit as because this is this is an unusual place for them to be in right now. But they're they're spending it. They might need to spend it a little more efficiently. But they're I think they're okay on that part. Now it's just a matter of get the players that Georgia wants. Get the players that mm-hmm. Alabama wants. You you are now spending in a way that they are spending. Your facilities look like their facilities. You just got to get them. And that's money too, though. Man. That's all exactly that's exactly. And money. now that's that's nil. And that, but that's using nil efficiently. So. We don't have a big sample size, but I, I think we, we've seen enough in two years to know that the way NIL works best is if you give the most money to the best players, the ones who have already proven that they are the best players. Mm-hmm. Like I think there's a thought out there that you can you can sort of tilt the scales in recruiting and get some guys you wouldn't normally get by – offering a, a bigger bag than than somebody else but i think there's a problem on the back end of that where your players who have already proven themselves they go uh-huh why are you giving that to that guy who does, hadn't done anything yet and so there there's your issue right there and you look at the schools that are doing it like alabama and georgia and ohio state have a prohibitive advantage here already because they don't necessarily have to offer as much up front because they can go look at all the first rounders we make because that is still the most powerful recruiting tool there is. We just made a bunch of first rounders. You could be the next one. And that there's more money in that than there is in NIL. And so they don't have to be as aggressive up front as these other schools do. The problem is how do you get in that club? And so mm-hmm. that, that's where Florida is at right now. You got to beat some of those schools for players. And I think... If you look at who Florida is actually coming down to now, like as finalists, it looks a lot different than two or three years ago. For sure. You know, you look at those graphics that, that on three or 24 seven puts up and it's, you know, we're crystal balling this guy to Florida and his second, you know, the, the other percentage choice is Georgia or is Clemson or is somebody like that. That's not what we saw two or three years ago. Like that's how you get back in this. Yeah, Dan Mullen came in and won with Jim McElwain's players, and year four came, and uh, you saw what his X's and O's looked like with his Jimmys and Joes. Um, I think that I think Florida is just in a place right now, and we didn't is down in a place right now, and we didn't realize how down Florida was, how down the roster was when compared, because right. Florida could be the tenth, have the top ten uh, recruiting class in the country, and be fifth or sixth in the SEC. Mm-hmm fourth in their own division, mm-hmm. third in their own yeah. division. So you're not competing with just the nation. You have, you're competing against the SEC, which is going to have Alabama, Georgia, Texas A&M, Tennessee to a degree right. in that top 10. You're competing against those guys and, and, and chasing and if you Georgia. Top, yeah, and if you do the top 100 count, it can get ugly. You mm-hmm. know, I, I, I think I did it in the story for the Dan Mullen era, and it was like Florida had 15 top 100 signees and, and Alabama had like 40. And Georgia had like 38. Which which year did Alabama have 15? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean that that's that's what you're dealing with. And I do think it's more difficult now than it was, say, when Urban Meyer got to Florida and then put that 2006 class together, because the best players tend to cluster more. It's mm-hmm. like the NBA super team thing. And that's that's been that was starting in the like late early you know, late aughts. Mm-hmm. And then really picked up steam last decade where we're all going to go to these schools and it's going to be Ohio State, Georgia, Clemson, or, or Alabama. And, and that's it. Or maybe LSU. And I'll be curious if NIL does change the, the dynamics of that a little bit because I think you did see some, some guys who would have clustered who maybe did say, I'll go here. But again, like I said, the, the other side of that argument of the, you know, you just hand out the biggest bag to the recruits. The guy who will take the biggest bag is probably going to be more of a problem mm-hmm. than the guy who's willing to take a smaller bag, but go to the place where he wants to be developed into a first rounder. That that guy who wants to be developed into a first rounder is thinking ahead, mm-hmm. is probably less likely to just bail on you, uh, sees the big picture a little better than the bat than the, the give me the big bag now guy. 
Yeah. And you know that they can be bought, right? So there right. can always potentially be another bag out there that's a little bit bigger. Um, just to, to highlight what you said earlier, Dan Mullen signed 15 players in the top 100 from 2018 to 2021. Uh, Nick Saban got 42 and Kirby Smart oh. got 40. So, um, I mean, just you, you it's going to be very, very tough to win and win consistently. Um, you just need a longer and, recruiting season, I think. <laughs> just, that's right. just too short. Um, I, I I did Dave Waters' podcast, and I, I meant to ask him about that, and I forgot. Like I I, I meant to ask him about asking that question because he mm. could not have thrown Dan Mullen a bigger softball. It, it's unbelievable. Dan, the twenty twenty Dan Mullen was really affable with us. Um, but stay after we talk about his son's golf and talk about all kinds of stuff after media. Uh, twenty twenty Dan, they're like. He, the zoom the zoom interviews did did him no favors yeah yeah it's it's a strange dynamic that that whole like that there's a book about that year to be written just because it's so strange and, and i had somebody who was it was actually multiple somebodies who were there that that said basically when when mullen did his new contract but didn't do anything for the very long time assistance that that had been mm -hmm. with him at a lot of places didn't do anything to extend their expiring contracts that they knew it was done then. Mm -hmm. And that was like April of that year. Of well, maybe save Florida some money in the buyouts. Um, Andy, want to, want to, want to ask you. So Florida's obviously had, you know, since urban Myers left. So since 2010 to now, Florida's now on their fourth head coach. And there's, you know, still question marks that a lot of fans have about, is this the right fit? Is this a guy that's going to be able to get Florida over the hump? If you're playing athletic director and let's just say your coach is Willie Mapier, right? So we're talking <laughs> hypotheticals here. Um, what are you looking for in progress beyond just wins on the football field to be able to evaluate or else you're then going on a coach number five and yep. what would probably be 15 years? I don't, I don't think anybody's going to hear this at Florida, but I, I actually think there's a good model to, to look at in Tallahassee. Look at how Mike Norvell's tenure has unfolded because it's a similar situation where he got hired after, right after a firing that was expensive and there was there's no way to fire him after one or two bad seasons. Like you had to give him time. And what you've seen is with that time, he's built a better program. He's fixed a lot of the problems that he inherited. And, you know, you go back to his 2021 season, they weren't great by any stretch of the imagination. Like they were down in Gainesville playing for bowl eligibility and lost, but they fought that entire season. They got better. It felt like as the season went on and that felt like, okay, these players believe in him. They believe in what he's doing. They will fight for him. They're not going to quit on him. That's a huge thing. So let's say in this season with Billy Napier, if Florida's sitting there at six and six at the end of the season, but they're fighting their ass off in every game, win or lose, and you see that the young players are like, let's say Andy Jean and Eugene Wilson turn out to be the best receivers by the end of the season, like that's a very positive sign. That's an arrow pointing up. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're looking at because Florida is not going to fire Billy Napier at the end of this season for mm -hmm. a bad season. Because they would owe him $31.8 million, I think, something like that. That's not a buyout Florida's going to pay. I, I just uh, I can't imagine the University of Florida ever paying that kind of buyout. So Wait, what, outside what, of some Hugh Freeze-esque scandal. You'd have to have a scandal, and then you can fire somebody for free. But that's a different, right. that's a different <clears throat> story entirely. But right. I, don't, I don't foresee that happening either. I, I think it's going to be a season that, that will be challenging – for Florida fans that they're not going to enjoy because they're not nice. where they want Florida to be. It's a nice way to put it. But the, but the way to, the way to evaluate it is as the season goes on, you get into the back half, even if, if the results aren't necessarily breaking your way, what is the, what is the product on the field look like? Is it getting better? Are the young players, the good ones are, mm -hmm. you know, are they fighting? Are they not quitting? That's the part that matters in this situation because that should give you hope that with another good recruiting class or two and, and to me there's a to me there's a, a scale like the scales of justice okay if if florida's five and seven mm -hmm. what does 
what do those young players look like? Right. What does the recruiting class look mm-hmm. like? Mm-hmm. Are you getting absolutely boat race by Georgia? Right. Um, do you lose at home to Arkansas, mm-hmm. uh, which would which would piss fans off? So Correct. to me, there's a there's a balance. What does it look like? I don't think Florida's not going to win the SEC East. They're not going to win the SEC. You need to have realistic expectations. But what swings that and balances things out? A top three recruiting class? Do you need a top five? Where do you? You know, I think I think there's so much of an eye test. Yeah, I I think if you're in the top, if you're in the top five, be happy because at that point Mm -hmm. it's really just how did you how do you develop them? You know, Alabama's had more number one classes than Georgia, but I think we can agree that Georgia's developed its signees better than anybody recently. (laughs) They did their uh, their staff turnover is 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 better as well at Georgia. They had more cons- uh, late right. consistency. As, as, yeah, consistency in that remark. Yeah. So I think I think that part, you know, you, you look at that and, and see are the young players developing. But I think you're right, Nick. That there's there's a there will be a point at the end of the season where we can look and say, all right, should everybody be optimistic, or is this all there is? But we don't know that right now. Mm-hmm. We, I, I do suspect, I think actually probably signing day will tell us that because they'll have just played Florida State. Signing day will come, assuming that's when DJ Lagway puts pen to paper. You know, he seems like a true believer in this mm-hmm. staff. And you, you kind of have to have one or two of those who can Pied Piper the other guys. And, and, and you don't know if he's going to be good or not. Like you know, five star. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. A little bit, Andy. <laughs> well, I will tell you, the way he acts, the way he carries himself, it certainly feels like he's that dude wherever he yeah. winds up. So, and he certainly seems to really love Billy Napier in Florida. So, if that's the case, it's reason for hope. Yeah, I always thought the hire when the hire was made, I thought it was a long term hire. Um, Regardless of what I think happens this year on paper schedule wise, nobody's going to be uh, judging or ready to fire uh, Billy Napier off of this season. I like your uh, your Mike Norvell don't, take. I think don't say game. nobody. I, I moderate a message board. He's oh, already, he, but he, people he that matter. Be wanting people to fire him. <laughs> yeah. The money will not be there, so don't yeah, worry yeah, about yeah, it. He's yeah, not yeah. going anywhere. Yeah, the people that people that actually matter. Um, I don't think they're going to be. Uh, looking to fire him because this was always a long-term play. If they wanted somebody to come in and do a quick flip, they would have hired a veteran coach like Dan Mullen when he came in. Um, but this was a talent acquisition in a long-term play mm-hmm. for us to be able to great, uh, get high-end recruits and change the culture. I don't think we ever did a full reset uh, since the Urban Meyer, which was a mm-hmm. very toxic era. I don't think we ever did a full rebuild. This is the actual full rebuild. And I think it's a, a long-term play. Uh, college football – I think in the grand scheme of it all, it's flipping with head coaches. You know, the whole scene is flipping. So it's new, younger faces that are going to be, you know, the face of college football in five years from now. Saban, I think, is going to be gone. You see what's happening with Jimbo Fisher out of Texas A&M. Uh, all the older guys that we know, the older names we know. I mean, even Kirby, he's a newer name, even though he's Kirby's high. He's 47. Been around. That's yeah, a problem. Right. right. He's going to be around a long time. Yeah. But that's what you're competing with. He he's top dog right now. You need somebody. You're aiming. You're not going to take Georgia down or knock him off his pivot, uh, or Kirby off his pivot in a year or two. This is a four or five year thing. Uh, Lagway is a good. That's my that's my barometer. When Lagway gets on campus as a freshman, you got a couple recruiting classes. You said Andy Gene and Eugene Wilson. Those guys will be on campus. They have plenty of weapons. Um, I like what we're doing on the defensive side of the ball. I like to see what the D.C. does, but in the trenches, linebacker-wise, you can see the uptick in talent. Yeah, the they're, gap. they're better on the D-line this year. And, I mean, you want to you wanna make my ears perk up. Like, tell me yeah. team's better on the D-line. Yeah. I I'm just seen a picture of Will Norman that got me super excited. Pause. But uh, he, he's looking like – because the D-tackle room is already uh, flipped. But if you got freshmen like Will Norman, uh, that's going to be – Kelby Collins. Here. Kelby yeah, Collins, Kelby, Kelby guys Collins, are the, they seem very, very excited about. And he's one you go out to practice and you look at him and you're like, oh, he looks different. Right. right. A- Andy, one of the things that I, you, you had mentioned about um, Mike Norvell and kind of what Florida State's doing is very different than what we've seen from a lot of what the top programs have done. You know, his recruiting has been even worse than Florida's recruiting has been over the last, you know, three or four years. Um, they filled a lot of it through the transfer portal. Yeah. Um, obviously you're not seeing 
Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State really play a lot in the transfer portal unless it's able to grab, you know, one, two, three of the the top players on the market, right? Jabbar Gibbs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you think it's a sustainable model? Uh, do you think for Florida, for the sake of Billy Napier, and obviously they've had to use a transfer portal more than those other programs have, um, but do you think that that's a sustainable model to build for the future? Is it really built around high school recruiting? Because that's the yeah. the one chink in the armor I see about Mike Norvell is obviously this year's recruiting class is going okay for them, but they've consistently been in the low teens to be able to compete in the SEC, compete in the ACC, obviously. But that that's the that's the difference. That's that's where where it's different. To, to compete in the SEC, you have to be able to develop the guys out of high school. You have to be able to get the top high school recruits and develop them. You can get by in the ACC doing it this way. Now, I think what, what Norvell ultimately wants to do to compete for national titles is use the success in the transfer portal to prove, you know, as a proof of concept of here, we can win here, and then you can go get better players out of high school, which you're seeing. There's an uptick in that. Uh, but – to compete in the SEC, to compete for SEC titles, you have to you have to draft. You have to win through the draft mm-hmm. more than free agency. And no, you you occasionally have to get good free agents. Like Georgia this year, they got Missouri's best receiver and Mississippi State's yeah. best receiver. You know, it, it, that wasn't an accident. You know, AD Mitchell, everybody's like, "Oh, AD Mitchell left for Texas. What what's Georgia going to do?" No, they recruited over him. Mm-hmm. Like there, it's cutthroat, baby. <laughs> you want to keep winning natties there, you, you've got to keep going. But that's what Florida, you know, Florida has to build through the draft, which Billy Napier seems to be trying to do. And I know there's criticism of him not flipping the roster as fast. And I've asked questions about that too, because I wonder why, you know, I watched Lincoln Riley go into USC, hired in the same cycle, and flip that roster very quickly. Now, he had a quarterback coming with him that he knew was special florida had a different situation where they had a quarterback that they knew was special that that they inherited that's going to be an interesting one too like watching anthony richardson develop that will reflect on billy napier one way or the one way or the other Mm. whether whether he succeeds the nfl or not now i don't think we're getting an answer to that season one it sounds like the colts want to play gardner Minshew and kind of bring anthony along slowly but if Anthony's great in the NFL and Florida's still struggling offensively, not good. That's a bad deal. If Anthony goes in the NFL I don't, I don't, and flames out, yeah, I don't necessarily agree with that because I mean, is he going to ball out year one with the Colts? Then I would judge Billy. Then, well, yeah, then you judge very harshly. But if they, I don't if they get three, four that, years yeah. to develop Anthony Richardson, you can't look back at Billy and say, oh, oh no, not three, were, four. I'm talking about year two, right? Which right. is probably when they're going to play him. So. That, but but the other thing is, if Florida has a, a competent offense, and look, there's no guarantee. It, I know there's a lot of negativity around Graham Mertz, but Graham Mertz was a very highly respected, highly recruited quarterback coming out of high school. He's the highest rated quarterback Wisconsin ever signed. We don't yet know if that was Graham Mertz or if that was Paul Chris, you know, kind of taking his hand off the till at, at Wisconsin. Because... You know, there, there's a lot of arguments to be made that Paul Chris kind of let recruiting go. They changed philosophies a little bit. It didn't work. So let's not dump it all on Graham Mertz just yet. Let's let him play a little bit at Florida before you, you judge what he What are you is. hearing? What are you hearing Mertz about mania. Graham Mertz? That he's, that he's a competent quarterback who can run this offense. That's I'm not going to oversell it. I, I said he was uh, on our message where I said Graham Mertz is fine. Um, that's there you go and yeah, they, he, they did not like that is there's he more a, likely to be murder mertz take another quarterback in the portal misdemeanor mertz yeah. yeah is he more likely to be murder mertz or misdemeanor mertz misdemeanor mertz <laughs> <God>. <laughs> uh yeah it, but the the thing is they looked at what was available and i i realized listen i i have friends that went to to florida who text me about this stuff all the time like who should we get in the portal and, and i had one who texted me said should we go after Chance Nolan? And I just texted back, listen, if you can get the guy who would have been Oregon State's third string quarterback, you really have to try, don't you? <laughs> I mean, that, but that's, that's what it is. It's like, oh, the next guy is going to be our next guy. No, don't, don't mess with the chemistry in your room unless you're sure there's somebody out there who's a better option. And I'm not sure there was anybody. Like the best, the best QB transfers this offseason probably were Sam Hartman. And Devin Leary, 
Mm-hmm. And Sam Hartman, I think Florida was looking at him. I think Auburn was looking at him. He wanted to go to Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. I, he picked Notre Dame. And and wouldn't you? They've got a first round offensive tackle on the left side. They have a, a definite NFL offensive tackle on the right side. All five of their offensive linemen are going to play in the league. Like he's never played behind a line like that before. So if you're him, you're looking at that. I got one year. I want to improve my draft stock, but I also want to win some games. That's the place you'd probably pick in that situation. The Devin Leary thing. I, Listen, that may wind up being a really good thing for Kentucky. We'll see mm-hmm. because he was great at NC State. Then he got hurt. Don't know how, what he's going to be like on the on the back end, but they've got the offensive coordinator back who was there for the better Will Levis season in 2021. And it, Liam Cohen's the guy's name. Mm-hmm. We will see if they get better. Their offensive line was not particularly good last year. So if, if they don't fix that part, it does, I don't know that it matters how good Devin Gary is. And you, you know about- we're running up against the oh, – go ahead, so. Yeah, it's probably my last one. I don't want to hold yeah. it too long, Andy. But what do you think about the quarterback play in the SEC East? SEC all together. I think everybody, or I know everybody's flipping quarterbacks. Uh, it, we have Mertz, but everybody's changing. Yeah, it's interesting because, like, Spencer Rattler looked great the last couple games of last season, but we he's got another new offensive coordinator. We don't know how good he's going to be. Joe Milton looked amazing in the Orange Bowl, but we've seen Joe Milton at Michigan and, and the first time around as Tennessee starter. So which which guy is he? Alabama's a mess. Like they didn't like anybody they had, so they went out and got Tyler Butler. Say, the say that one more time. I haven't heard that in a, in fifteen years. I just mean in the quarterback room. Well, no, no, just say They're it fine everywhere read. else. And no, no, we need to clip it and, uh, and yeah, it yeah. I, it's just got Alabama's a mess. Oh boy, <laughs> right there. there. It is. Let's go. I yeah, appreciate it on YouTube short right there. there. Just yeah. flame, flame on. No, no, I. But they are in the in the quarterback room. Would would you have expected this? From them now, like they got four top 100 guys at quarterback on scholarship, and they get out of spring, and they're like, eh, I guess we'll grab another one. So, you know, Jaden Daniels, I thought had a, a good end of the season at LSU. It felt like the turning point might have been that Florida game. And Garrett Nussmeyer, his backup, looks like he could be pretty good too. So, LSU feels pretty stable. Connor Wegman at Texas AM, I really like. It's just, what about all the rest of it? The guy who I think could be really interesting, and I, I've been beating this drum for a little while, is Carson Beck because he's been waiting around. He got beat out by Stetson Bennett two years ago. Yeah, he, he just said, I, and he'll like, I do radio with Aaron Murray. And Carson told Aaron Murray, hey, I wasn't ready to start at Georgia. But instead of transferring and just going somewhere where he could start, he was like, if I hang here, I might only be a one year starter at Georgia but I could be a one-year starter who goes to New York for the Heisman ceremony and, and winds up in a good spot in the draft mm-hmm. because he's going to have a ton of weapons at his disposal. You know, that offense will look, look a little bit different. Uh, Darnell Washington being gone, you're not run, You're probably not running as much. The, the, you're playing a lot more. Two, you're playing the same amount of two tight ends, but they're, they're spread out a little more. So the quarterback's going to get a little more to do. And that dude, he's the right size for the NFL. So if he has a big year, it could be a really good year for him. Um, Final question, Andy. I know you got to run here soon. Uh, Article that you put out, uh, how the Florida-Georgia football rivalry game um, could have to move from Jacksonville. Um, Jacksonville, I guess the contract runs out this year, Mm -hmm. uh, but there's an opportunity to extend it for maybe two more years. I know Jacksonville has talked about doing um, some stadium improvements, uh, whole city improvements, hopefully during that time as well. Uh, But what do you think is, uh, if you're prognosticating, what's going to happen to that Florida-Georgia game? It's interesting because I just assumed if they're tearing down the stadium and rebuilding, because they're doing that to keep the Jags. Let's let's be clear here. I, I've had people say, you know, why, why are they, is Florida, Georgia that important? That they do? I'm like, they're doing that to keep the Jaguars because if the, their lease runs out in 2030. And if they don't like the stadium, they're going to leave. So that's why they're doing it. And it's going to cost two years of the Florida, Georgia game. The question is what, what happens. And my assumption was you just put it on campus, just like they did in the nineties, talking to some people, at both schools, I was not really aware of how much money they make in Jacksonville. It is essentially the the take of a home game every single year for both teams. Mm-hmm. So 
if you go home and home, it means each school is giving up essentially a game per year of revenue or, or one of those years they're giving up a game games worth of revenue. So if I six, seven million bucks. And so I wouldn't be shocked if in those two years it's away from Jacksonville, it gets shot to Atlanta, Orlando, Miami, Tampa. And if it winds up at one or, or more of those spots, the price for Jacksonville goes up to get it back. Mm. I like being able to move it around like that. I don't mind going to Atlanta, Tampa. Tampa's very close. Orlando, that stadium is a little meh. All I've heard is Silk saying you'd rather go anywhere else but Jacksonville. We've been preaching on that. it for you, years. It's all, it's all about how you frame <laughs> you, it, Dan. You can't, you can't leave Jacksonville to then play in the Citrus Bowl. Camping World Stadium. The the it, it, well, World yeah, Stadium. well, they they the only money they've put into the Citrus Bowl is to change the name and the signage. What if, what if you're leaving to play in a stadium with a pirate ship, or to play in a yeah. stadium where you can get a Chick Fil A sandwich for two dollars and fifty cents? I you, think. Do you well, see I'm, that I'm, happening? Do you see? I'm, I'm firmly in the camp of play it two years in Jacksonville, uh, and then every and then you know rotating one in games, one in Athens. Then you get. If you're at Florida or Georgia for four years, you get the full experience. You play in all three places. I don't. I don't get playing it in Tampa. Well, um, you're gonna have to write a check for like three and a half million dollars to each school. Well, you know Disney. Di- Disney's cutting all of the SEC schools very large checks for the next decade. <laughs> uh, so I have a hard time feeling bad for the presidents and athletic directors at Florida, Georgia, who are like, oh no, we're going to lose $3 million. That's cool. You're getting an extra that's a lot of money. Uh, 12. Money. You're getting an extra 12 from your team. Nick, in real life, that's a lot of money. You got $3 million laying around. Like, that's why I read Nick over here. here. <laughs> no, but it's the, just the, the drop the, in the bucket for his uh, the, paycheck. The, the, the TV and, money that's, that's about to change is, is it's just funny money that they're playing with now. So, uh, the the money the the difference the, of losing that one home game is nowhere near the amount of money you're going to be getting from ESPN compared to what you were getting from CBS. But you could also get that and three and a half million. Right, 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 right. Gordon Gecko, greed is good. <laughs> you know, it's better than than the SEC ESPN contract. The SEC Not much. ESPN contract, Jimbo's contract, three and a half million dollars. That's true. That's <laughs> also, true. The SEC ESPN contract, three and a half million dollars and right. a ham sandwich. Also better. And the well, Chick Fil A two dollar fifty joint. Hey, that too. I guess right you. In. I guess you still got to pay Dan Mullen. Keep that game in Jacksonville. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Was it one, once a year for six years? Mm, yeah. Since they fired him. July first. It, it's Christmas in July every year in the Mullen household. He's living it up. Well, Andy, we know you got to go, my friend. It's a pleasure chatting up with you again. We'll have to do it before the season starts. But just remind everybody if they don't know where they can follow you and read all of your great articles. So I'm at The Athletic. You can go to theathletic.com, sign up. Uh, also, The Andy Staple Show, wherever you get podcasts. Costs you nothing. Also on YouTube, The Andy Staple Show, if you want to look at my ugly face while I'm talking. So that's, uh, that's where you find me. Andy's broadcasting in 4K, it looks like. Great, crisp, great webcam there you have. Andy. We'll I, got, I see you for a jog. I look like I'm crying because I'm sweating. So. <laughs> that's what you get for sitting in the hot seat on Stadium and Gale, brother. We'll talk to you soon, my friend. All right, see you guys. See you. All right, Andy. All right, Andy Staples. Let's talk a little bit about all of that. But before we do that, let's give a quick shout out to our friends over at the Gatorverse. Go visit them at Gatorverse.io. We talked a little bit about it last week, uh, about their TBT roster that they're putting together. Uh, their roster includes right now, Kayvon Allen, Flandris Fleming, Corey Brewer, Igor Kulachev, Keith Stone. They're still waiting on a few more. Do want to announce also that Torian Green is going to be their player coach and their head coach is going to be Matt McCall, who was a former assistant with Billy and now head co- and former head coach at UT Chattanooga. UT Chattanooga and UMass. Um, they're going to be having an open scrimmage at a local gym uh, during training camp, which is going to be July 20th to the 24th. Um, there's going to be a bunch of ways for you to engage uh, with the old legends if you are a fan. So again, go visit Gatorverse.io. Support your student athletes through NIL and root on the Gatorverse team in the TBT uh, tournament. All right, boys. Um, a lot of good talk there with Andy. Any thoughts on kind of the first half of that discussion on his article on Florida rebuilding? Um, then we'll get into this Jacksonville conversation. 
No, nah, good conversation. I enjoy that conversation with Andy. It's always dope. Um, so what are your thoughts? I know you were uh, kind of bringing them in a little bit there during the conversation, but um, what are your thoughts on the, the Florida-Georgia game and, and what would you want to get done? Yeah, I would want them to play. Like I said, I wouldn't mind. I don't want – Atlanta would be fun, but that that puts it on their turf. Uh, we, we'd rather it be in Florida just to keep it, you know, uh, super Florida, keep that game Florida than Georgia game. Um, but, yeah, Tampa sounds great. I'm not a big fan of Camping World Stadium, the stadium, but mm. uh, I love Orlando, that location, mm -hmm. uh, and being able to do some other things and not drive uh, past two hours to see my boys play, man. So I wouldn't mind either one of those stops. And if Atlanta, they got to do yeah. something, right? They got to take it somewhere for two years. Wouldn't mind mm -hmm. spending a time in Atlanta. I got family in Atlanta as well, my brother. So I'm good either way. The home and the home and all that stuff that Nick was trying to figure out seems like a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Uh, that's um, easy. And and I'll have to keep my calendar and my notifications on to, to figure out where the game's on at, games at every year. Um, I don't know why you'd play the game uh, in Georgia Tech's area of Georgia. Uh, I know that uh, Kirby Smart likes to use, you know, the Atlanta stuff in recruiting, uh, but that is where Georgia Technological Institute or Institute of Technology, whatever they are. They're not uh, serious about where, football, though. That's where the Ramble and Rec plays. Um, so – to me, I, I think, you know, it's part of it's selfish. Um, I've covered Florida for 10 years. I've been to every SEC stadium except for Auburn, except for Georgia. And unless I leave this market and go cover a different SEC team, I'm not going to ever see Athens. Um, yeah, I think it's a great it, I think it's a great environment for a game. Um, and the last time Florida was there, they hung half a hundred. I'd like to go and see that. Um I think it's a really cool thing that Florida and Georgia have this neutral site game. Um, there's not, there's not too many of those yearly. The Red River rivalry sticks out. Um, I think you could make it unique where you have it rotating. Um, and uh, I, I think this is a perfect opportunity to kind of gauge that. I don't feel bad for Florida or Georgia missing out on three and a half million dollars. I don't think they're, I don't think they're missing their bills. They're making, they're making plenty of money. Do you think if this game does leave Jacksonville for a home and home situation, um, do you think it would ever return to a neutral side game? I, I think Andy made a lot of sense, and that's definitely a bargaining chip that I think Florida and Georgia will use, and that would keep it away from just going to a home and home. Mm -hmm. um, in the '90s, the TV money wasn't like this. Um, and, and the money or in college football in general wasn't like this. So it was, oh, shoot, we have a problem. Let's just play at home. Now you can shop this game, which even when Florida is down right now or when Florida was drubbing Georgia for most of our lifetime, um, it, it, it it's still a game that everyone gets up for, that you're going to sell tickets out for. And if you move it and say, hey, we're going to do it one year in Atlanta, one year in Tampa, um, and now you're competing with – now Jacksonville, who's had a stranglehold on it, is now competing with other big, massive cities that are closer to fan bases. Um, and that would be a great bargaining chip. I don't know what the city of Jacksonville has in terms of coffers to pay that. Um, you know, maybe Dan can write a check to Duval County. Uh, poor, to keep, poor Nick. To keep, to keep the game. Oh, no. It's got it's to gotta be the biggest tourism driver – of the city of Jacksonville. Um, so I can imagine them wanting to keep it. Um, that, that's house? my, that's my thing, right. Is, is all of a sudden you, you move it to, to a home and home, right? Like now you start to talk about economic development for, for Gainesville, right? So yes, the university of Florida might lose that money, but also you have more fans in the city, the city of Gainesville, the city of Athens, the surrounding areas, definitely probably want that game. You have an additional game uh, every other year. And now all of a sudden you start to worry about, you know, not worry, but now all of a sudden now you're in discussion with hotels that now want that revenue restaurants that want that revenue. Right. So I think if it moves away and moves into a home and home situation, I think it's going to be a really tough game to move back into a neutral site game, unless you do a situation where you play a game in, Tampa or Orlando, wherever, and a game maybe in Atlanta, right? You can't go to like 
Valdosta and play at Valdosta High School for two years. There's no really other in between spot that they could do a neutral site game. Um, so, but that's my my fear is that unless you sign a contract after that, the second you go to a home and home, it stays that way. And who knows with what the SEC might do with scheduling? Again, we haven't decided what what permanent rivalries are going to be, but maybe that also changes. Um, you know, the Florida Georgia game in the future being a a permanent rival or, or not. So I don't, I don't know a lot to consider beyond just beyond just Jacksonville, but I would, I would hate to see it happen to Jacksonville. You know what I hate to see? I would hate to see spike shoulder pass and white Buffalo. Mm. (laughs) Seeing, seeing people bark and and spike shoulder pass around midtown is going to be egregious activity, man. (laughs) Hey, Um, but we'll uh, I, we'll I, see. I, There's I a think, lot. What? I think the owners of White, but the owner of White Buffalo Oak uh, and new <laughs> uh, oh, shoot, what's the name? I'm going to get the name right. Yeah, well, they they've got some signage up now. So Can, Cantina Nuevo, no. Anejo, one hundred and one. Cantina Anejo. Mm, big tequila. Boom, big tequila. There it is. It's, it's, co- it's coming tequila. soon. We got oh. dress code though. No spike shoulder pads. No well, that's, that's, that it's just a safety hazard, you know. Yeah. All right. Um, let's get into baseball, Nick. Uh, oh. Gator, Gators claim. I'm with DK, man. Wait till we get back competitive. Wait till our roster and we 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 back to our shenanigans. Then we can do the home at home. Right now, we don't need spite show to pass in my city right now, bro. Um <laughs> Let's see. We live in a capitalist society. There's no way that both teams would agree to throw away millions of dollars plus the freedom to party and drink openly. Only is enticing life. to fans who spend millions. Again, we you, again you have to consider that wherever else they would do some sort yeah. of home and home or some sort of neutral site, there would probably be some economic development there. Um, Buddy, I, don't I like know that take, you. Dan. That, that is a good take because the city there's so many businesses and like you said, the city of Gainesville would benefit from such a big game, another rivalry game in the city. So. Right, especially the Georgia uh, game, right? Your biggest robbery. What? What's yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, but but don't think about the uh, small local businesses because the the University Athletic Association might lose out on some money uh, in the in the next year. So, so sorry, Cantina. Nick's Nick to Nick's only thinking about the hedge money. All yeah, right, I don't think Shrek's Shrik, um, gonna be worried about uh, Zika. <laughs> bro. Um, Nick Gators claim a co SEC championship. Uh, with um, uh, in in baseball, they do claim the number one overall seed in the SEC tournament. Uh, Nick, you were uh, hot on um, Twitter and on the message boards this past week as well, saying that you didn't understand how winning the SEC tournament and not winning the regular SEC crown uh, they they shouldn't be conflated as equal. Uh, but ultimately, the Gators do. Uh, pull off a big, big victory and, and series win uh, this past weekend. So, Nick, talk to us a little bit about baseball. Yeah, bro. I had to mute that clown. Somebody yeah, you're... Some, somebody was just like, the tournament's more important than the regular season. And th- they're arguing my point, which was, I think, and it was literally just my opinion um, and probably the opinion of 14 SEC coaches, but I digress. Um, <laughs> it's more of a testament to the team that you are and, and the team that wins the 10 weekends going in into and hosting other sec competition versus who gets hot for one week in Hoover when in baseball, which is different than basketball, you you're working pitchers arms and you're managing pitchers arms. So when, if Florida gets to, Saturday, Sunday, the semifinal and the final, they're not going to throw Brandon Sprout or Hurston Waldrip or Jack Caglione. They're going to throw whoever, whoever's left. And that's how the tournament works. So you're not getting your best baseball in the semifinal or the final because you're four days away from the actual NCAA tournament, a tournament that matters, a tournament that determines the national champion is coming up. So you're not going to throw your best pitchers three days after they had just thrown four days before you're going to ask them to throw again. So the SC tournament uh, is not a great competition in terms of, uh, you know, picking who's going to be the best team of the year. It's just something that they do at the end of the season. Um, Florida had an incredible season, only dropped two SEC series, um, won 20 games and kind of needed a bunch of things to happen for them 
on Sunday or on Saturday, excuse me, to to win the SEC. So they need to take care of business, which they do. You get a unbelievable game from Jack Caglione, probably the best game he's ever thrown, career high in, in innings and strikeouts. Um, you also needed Georgia and Vanderbilt to win. So Florida fans were in a position where they're rooting for Vanderbilt, who's a rival in baseball, and Georgia, who's a rival in everything, um, to – to, to win their games and and georgia took care of lsu and um and game. vanderbilt took care of business against arkansas so you get a situation where florida and, and arkansas share the sec title um and because of tiebreaker rules florida will get the number one seed in hoover the gators just moved up to number two in the country um behind wake forest rake forest um so I said all year long, you guys tried to get me to lie and hype this Gator team up. I said there will be no hype. Um, They've just quietly uh, gone about their business. And uh, it's been a fun team to cover. This team really hits well. And uh, I think you're seeing, especially Jack Caglione on the the mound, you're seeing him start to pitch his best uh, at the right time. And I think you're seeing Wyatt Langford really locking in and – and I think Florida has the tools to make a run here, um, much to the chagrin of my fiance, because Florida's uh, the last game of the College World Series would be the Monday of my wedding week. Um, and uh, St. Augustine is not close to Omaha, Nebraska. Not close. I don't know if you've looked, but it's not close. You're muted, Dan. You're muted. You're still muted. Yeah, you're muted. You're still you're muted, Dan. You had a nice little bag there, too. Sorry, sorry about yeah. that. Uh, well, it looks like you were saying great stuff there. Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I was. Um, I was talking <laughs> about your your geography lesson that we taught you a few weeks ago about where Iowa <laughs> was, um, but about how Omaha and St. Augustine, it just it slapped a lot better in real time. So I appreciate you telling me that I was muted. Um, Gators uh, kick off the tournament this week. Is that right, Nick? Yeah, five thirty Eastern time. I think they play the winner of Kentucky, Alabama. Um, I'll be in Hoover. I'll be in uh, beautiful suburban Birmingham for as long nice. as Florida is there. That's not, there's nothing nice about Hoover. Make sure you bring a good book for reading. I know that they won't have them for sale in Alabama. Um, want to talk <laughs> about the Florida <laughs> men's golf team? Uh, they are headed uh, to the finals of the uh, NCAA golf tournament. Incredible round, uh, final round, shot an eight under uh, to erase a seven-shot deficit uh, that they had. Yushin Lin, Ricky Castillo, and John Dubois um, had a, a fantastic round. Gator shot uh, the tournament best round uh, at a minus eight for, uh, for the third day. So they will uh, go to Arizona, I believe, this week at the Greyhawk Golf Tournament, I believe is in Scottsdale, uh, but an incredible uh, performance by them to advance to the finals. Uh, one of the first times that they've been there in quite some time. So shout out to them. Uh, let's give a quick shout out to our friends over at Home Field Apparel. You've been waiting. It's been two years or so uh, since they announced their Florida Gators line, and they are releasing eight new designs this Saturday. So as a reminder, use promo code Stadium and Gale. It will get you 15% off of your order. Really cool, really unique designs. I think that you guys will like them, including a golf T-shirt. Uh, with a gator swinging a golf club, different than the one that you've seen on some of the polos they've done, uh, some national championship stuff from the uh, the 05, 06 years. They've got a hoodie. Uh, they've got a uh, quarter zip. They've got a tail gator shirt that looks straight out of the 1970s. So go check that out at 10 a.m. on Saturday. Again, homefieldapparel.com, promo code Stadium and Gale. Uh, the... We have talked about it, um, but the Gators have a very tough schedule, obviously, this year. ESPN has the Gators ranked with the third toughest schedule in college football this year behind Ole Miss and Minnesota, Maryland, Auburn, Arkansas, Michigan State, and Tennessee round out the top eight. Uh, Does that sound about par to you guys? It's like that every year, man. 
Yep. I've never heard uh, us come into a season like, oh, this season, we got an easy schedule every year. It's yeah. going to be a tough schedule, bro. Bro, the 2020 was going to be an easy schedule, I think, before COVID. In terms, like, relative to what yeah. it made, it made it tougher schedule going is. all SEC. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like, before it went all SEC, Florida's, you look at that Florida schedule in 2020, and I shudder to think Damo might still be here if, if not for COVID. But, um, no, you still you, had to roll that mid out to the field. So I don't think so. No, but that, that, that 2020 schedule is going to be in terms of having to play the SEC East was going to be cake. And then you look at what Florida had on offense. You were playing with roughly the cast of the Avengers on offense. Um, and you just need to figure some things out on defense. But that, that schedule was way easier before. It went to that 10 game all SEC. Regardless of what happened that year, like eventually Dan Mullen was gonna roll out that mid. Like our fan base was unhappy with New Year's Six Bowls. You know, like going to the SEC championship. You, you look at the coaches that we fired. It's not like they came out and just rolled out a bunch of mid. They had some some runs. Uh we was excited with Dan yeah, Mullen. Shout out to the runs. Team. Shout out to the runs, man. But both of those, both all those coaches, uh uh must champ McElwain and Mullen. We gotta get away from M's uh, for for one thing. Glad we mm. did, but uh, all those there. all those guys, <laughs> all those guys had SEC championship runs, uh, New Year's Six Bowl uh, games. But at the end of the day, this is a very we talked a lot about you know what Florida need to do, but we also got to talk about this fan base. Um, we didn't get a talk, chance to talk about that with Staples, but this is a very demanding st- uh, fan base. I, I don't think even if Mullen would have won. We had our regular schedule. He makes it to the playoffs. We'd be, we'd be hiring a coach right now at some point. Because mm. he still had to roll that mid out. Mm. He still was benching Anthony Richardson, you know, for Emory Jones. Uh, you know, only reason we got to see trash is because Felipe got hurt. So it was still a lot of just yeah. quarterback yeah. decisions. I don't I don't foresee Dan Mullen being a long-term situation. He was out of here regardless. As long as 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 high as I've been on Anthony Richardson, I don't think he was ready to start to be that guy kind of like what what andy just said was? carson beck no no no. oh well let me finish um <laughs> but like you you knew what emory jones was and what he was going to be and i think at some point i would have just not against georgia not against that georgia defense that was just dan mullen proving a point to fans hey i'm smarter than you look this is what this is what it would be like if anthony started i'm like this would be this would, this is what it's been like with every quarterback that started against mm-hmm. that georgia defense i think i would have turned to anthony richardson i think i even wrote it um i think i wrote in the same season i don't think that anthony richardson is ready to start yet at this school but i think you've already seen what the guy ahead of him is and mm-hmm. it's probably just time to make the move and, and take your lumps this year and he'll be better for it in the following season yeah, I think the, the 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 best coaches they can look past the ready to start stuff when you just see you know generational talent. We've always mm-hmm. we all had that that opinion about Ar the moment he showed up that he was generational talent, and regardless of you know like his rawness, you knew and and I say I told the fans is we're gonna get to see this kid one year, and he's gonna go off to the league and do great things, and we all gonna look back and say what what could have been, mm-hmm. and. Dan Mullen just couldn't see past his shoes. And it was more politics than Anthony Richardson not being ready. It was more politics. Mm-hmm. He made promises to Emory Jones about certain things, and he was going to see it through. Couldn't see opinion. past those pleats, right, Dan? Baggy Could not pleats. see past those pleats, no. And, I mean, the bagginess <laughs> of those khakis probably really did Insane. hinder his shoes, even being able to see his shoes, you know? Use code Dan Mullen for Hong Kong Andy. I don't want to talk about Dan no more. What we got next? What are we talking about? <laughs> well, that's what we were talking about. Um, let's see. In um, An article came out um, from Zach Albaverde of On3. Um, had an article posted uh, between uh, Jeff Demps and Chris Rainey, who won their legendary street race. Uh, it looks like... Um, both sides are taking uh, their respective side. Uh, Jeff Dem said with a smile, with all due respect, um, with all due respect, I had to say it twice to make sure all the due respect was put out. You can't even mention me and Rainey uh, in the same speed. So uh, there's a lot of talk in this conversation in this article about racing Noel Devine, um, all That's of that. But uh, let's, let's, that let's break it down a little bit. Uh, well, who do you guys think would have won? Bro, and, Demps. Yeah, Demps is like world class speed. I think Rainey said in a forty, because 
he 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 would beat Dems, and I, I I don't know if I believe that even. Uh, well, we Dems is just world class fast, man. Yeah, I I was there for uh, we we interviewed Jeff at his Hall of Fame induction, and then we ran up on Chris Rainey. He was at Pro Day. Um, Demps and Rainey have very different stories. Uh, Zach and I talked to a bunch of people. Zach ended up talking to Urban about it. Um, and and Chevy Chevy told me on Twitter or tweeted at me today said that the race you need to be talking about is Chris versus Percy, and they raced in the swamp, and we didn't get. We didn't get that story, but Chris says they raced one time and he beat Jeff. Jeff says they raced three times. He beat him the first two. Um, and uh, uh, Ahmad refused to be interviewed for the story. <laughs> Ahmad wasn't there, doesn't know anything about it. Yeah, I'm trying to trying to see where there's, um, you know, some, some good little tidbits here. Uh, Well-researched story. Um, from uh, from Zach, very very interesting and intriguing uh, things to come. Go sign up for On Three, uh, who does not sponsor this program, but is the uh, the the proud um, sponsor of my mortgage. Yeah, proud sponsor of Nick's mortgage. Uh, but ultimately, a really really cool story uh, to share. I think Jeff Demps uh, won, and I think that if they race ten times, I think Jeff Demps wins the ten times. And so maybe that was. One of the three. Yeah, they was talking about with. fastest uh, gators in, in, in that thread. Fastest gator of all time. I've seen mm -hmm. a lot of names. Um, Bo Carroll, John Capel. A lot of names came back up. But y'all did not put Deontay Thompson in there. And that's that's disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Well, Capel, Capel and, and, and Demps have, what, 1001 official 100 times? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. So what's, what's DT's? Oh, it's up there. I don't know. I'll, I'll go check. I, he ran track at UF, right? I got. I got to check Deontay. Thompson well, like Chris. Times. Well, Chris Rainey did too, but Chris only did it one year. Jeff Demps is still the only athlete at the University of Florida to have a national championship in multiple sports. Mm. Fun fact. Um, there's a a great picture, and it was always one of my favorites. This was back when I was uh, working with the team. Um, I'm going to read you guys the posted forty times. From this looks to be probably 2008. Uh, Chris Rainey, 424. Mm -hmm. Lewis Murphy, 425. Percy Harvin, 428. Deontay Thompson, 428. Wandy Pierre Louis, 431. Joe Hayden, 433. Uh, Williams, oh, what was his name? Starts with a J. Um, Jarvis Williams? No, this would have been during that time. Uh, it'll come to me in a second. Four three five. Keystone Moore four three seven. Dorian Shoot. Monroe four three seven, and then uh, Anderson and Brandon James at four four zero. Um, Lewis Murphy's speed. Lewis Murphy's the the sneaky one on that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you know, yeah. He, ran, he ran crazy fast at the uh, the combine as well. I was actually shocked a little bit, but but a lot of his teammates said that he was extremely fast. That, that's doesn't... what I mean, though. Like yeah. you look at him and you watch him play, and you're like, ah. Yeah, I got to compare these numbers to combine times. There's a couple talks about it there in, uh, in YouTube. By the way, if you're watching, I need to please hit that like button, uh, that subscribe button. Um, I would say for me, some of the names that stood out on this list that is obviously hand timed uh, and definitely favors some faster times. Uh, Joe Hayden, I know he was a, a speedster, but a 4-3-3. Um, and then Keystone Moore, a bigger running back, um, not a, a Jeff Demps or Chris Rainey in size, uh, but running a four three seven was a, a little bit surprising okay. to me as well. But again, these are juice. all not official forty yard dashes from the There's NFL juice. combine. For sure. Yeah, quick thumb. Quick thumb. The quick thumb. Yeah. Get the morale up in the locker room. Yeah. Man. Man, you, you boys are getting fast, man. <laughs> Keep working. <laughs> they they yeah, that, knew they knew how to stroke their egos, right? Already. That's it. That's the day after one of those like tough match uh, match row days. It's like ah, listen, they're not uh, they're not feeling great. Uh, choked each other out yesterday. Uh, right, let's let's right, get some right. nice let's get some nice stopwatch times. 
Um, gentlemen, any final thoughts before we get to the end of the show? Recruiting is on a bit of a, uh, not hiatus necessarily, but it's definitely slowed down until that big June 2nd weekend. I know that it's a weekend. Uh, PJ DJ is coming into town along with uh, Jeremiah Smith and a number of others. Uh, gentlemen, any uh, thoughts on uh, anything else going on in Gator country right now? No, that's it, man. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit of recruiting. What do you guys yeah. think? We're not going to deep dive on it, but um, shout out to my guy Walt on the timeline. He, he mentioned just the wide receiver recruiting. Um, and, and if Kerry Coble were here, that room would probably be filled. Uh, I thought it was an interesting uh, point, but I think the board got reset. I don't mm-hmm. think I know the board got reset. Uh, I've seen a lot of different offers that went out in 2023. Uh, getting DJ Lagway just changed. A, a lot of relationships and, you know, the type of receivers we could bring in. While I do like Kerry Colbert and the recruiter he was, I don't think Billy G in a bad position at all. Um, I like the, the Jeray Hawkins kid out of IMG. I like TJ Moore. Um, and we're still trying to get guys like JoJo Trader and, and, and Jeremiah Smith. So I think it's top tier talent and I think it's going to fill out with, and you got to keep in mind, Billy Napier is the end all be all wide receiver guy. Uh, when it pertains to our roster and recruiting. So I think it's going to be top tier stuff in that room once again. But uh, right now we have one guy committed. What do you guys mm-hmm. take on the wide receiver? Yeah, I, I don't think you're going to get Jeremiah Smith to flip, but I think JoJo Trader is a great consolation prize right there, you know, at, at the same school. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I've, from what I've heard, I think you're, I think you're getting, um, I think you're getting more of that recruiting coordinator, Urban Meyer, Billy G, than than the guy who was recruiting with Dan Mullen. And I think mm-hmm. that just comes from the top down of the expectations and the demands of you, you, what you need to be doing on the recruiting trail. Yeah, no, 100%, Nick. I'm just looking through um, the list of offers right now and where Florida is trending at the wide receiver position. I know TJ Moore from Tampa Catholic is a guy that, that Florida is very high on and he's high on Florida as well. Um, he's ranked as the number 148th overall player, number 26 wide receiver in the country. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Jojo trader from uh, Chaminade Madonna down there in Miami. And then Zion Reagan's from Jones County. It looks to be a South Carolina, Florida battle. He's ranked as the number 132 uh, player. Um, but then you have to scroll down quite a bit to see, you know, Florida really, you know, all in or, or even favored for, for any other uh, commit at the wide receiver position. Um, James Randall is a guy from mainland uh, that Florida is trending for. Uh, Zakaro William – or Lewis, pardon me, from uh, Carol Wood Day uh, – might be a, a plan B or plan C guy. Um, but, you know, again, if you get a guy like Jojo Trader, I think that Florida is in a, in a fine spot, but you would hope that getting a DJ Lagway, a, a highly touted five-star uh, that you'd be able to, to try to flip one or, or more or, or bring in one or more of the bigger names, you know, those highly ranked four stars or those five-star guys. And I just don't know if I see Florida able to do that just yet. Already, that's all I have. Um, so- uh, big, big month coming up. Florida will have, uh, I think, forty-five is the number I was told, and that that uh, that we put up on our on our site. Forty-five mm-hmm. official visitors in the month of June. Yes, sir. It's official visit yep. season, man. Uh, run through this real quick. June second, Jeremiah Smith, who we mentioned, DJ Lagway, um, Xavier Philsame, Philsame. Philsame. Phil- Asami. Asami. Yeah. Uh, Jordan Ross, who's a four star edge. Uh, Darius Hayes, the four star linebacker, will be. Jamari Howard, who recently decommitted from Michigan State. Florida sits in a good spot. I know Florida State's trending for him as well. Uh, four star tight end Jonathan Nichols. Uh, he's committed to Tennessee. Uh, Florida's been really high on him, really recruiting him hard. Uh, four star cornerback Jalen Crawford. Uh, four star defensive lineman Jalen Evans, who. Uh, is committed to Texas A&M, but I know that there's a lot of smoke about Florida uh, really you know, trying to put the pressure on him to flip. flip. Watch, baby. He's from a Longview, Texas, and I believe Gator great Tate Casey is from Long, a Longview, Texas as well. 
I could be wrong. Chris Jones, uh, the four-star linebacker, of Florida sits in a really good position for uh, right now for Mountain View, Georgia, home of Jermaine Cunningham, I believe. Uh, four-star offensive tackle, Ethan Calloway. Uh, four-star wide receiver commit, Isaiah Williams. Uh, four-star defensive lineman, Deontay Robinson from Jones High School in uh, Orlando. Uh, three-star safety commit, Josiah Davis and three-star DN Kendall Jackson uh, from Buholtz there in Gainesville. Uh, he's uh, rising up. I know a lot of the recruiting rankings right now, and if he has a good year, we'll probably end up being a four-star as well. Um, without confusing you, there's a lot of names for June uh, 9th and June 16th as well, but we'll go over those uh, as we get a little bit closer. Um, there is a commit um, – piece of news out there four-star running back anthony rogers who's a class of 2025 uh he is going to be announcing his commitment on june 2nd from alabama auburn florida georgia and oregon so he's the number one or no pardon me number eight running back uh in that class and the number 96 overall recruit for the class of 2025 uh five foot eight 185 pounds so big weekends on June 2nd, June 16th, June 9th has some names in there, but those are the three weekends to be looking out for. Uh, I know Harrison Sanchez brought it up uh, in the group chat or in the chat here. Uh, Chauncey Bowens is going to be visiting Georgia um, in the next couple of weeks as well. Are you guys worried about a flip there? No, we Gucci, man. You know, so we upset Gucci. it. Gucci, man. I'm the Palm Beach ambassador, man. I got this locked down, man. Bowens is going to be all right. We good. Gucci bags. Perfect. Nick, you have song of the week. So think about that as we do our final ad read for our friends over at Alumni Hall. Go visit them on Archer Road or visit them at alumnihall.com. Get all of your latest and greatest of Florida Gators apparel, uh, outerwear, um, shoes, cups, uh, beach bags, uh, towels, all of that fun stuff, golf balls, uh, all of that. Go visit Alumni Hall. Nick, did you go to that event last Monday? I did not. I did okay. not. Something came up. Um, yeah. No, but right. I will be at a Billy Napier event tonight. He's talking to the, I believe, Fighting Gator Club tonight. So I'll go and see him. Was down there in Miami last weekend. Um, yeah. Last one. Perfect. Last one, best um, one. The St. Pete Gator Club is bringing in uh, Todd Golden. I'm not sure if that's been an official announcement yet, but they're going to bring him in on June 20th. If you are in now. Uh, the greater St. Petersburg, Florida area, go check out Todd Golden. It's on a Tuesday night. Uh, but, Nick, you have the song of the week. Take us out. Um, don't know that this is the uh, a lyrically great song, but oh it is a it's big summer vibes. Hmm. Big summer vibes. It's called Bit Same Friends. Shanty. No pirate shanty. I'll have one for you always, though. Um, it's called Same Friends by Charlie on a Friday and Lil TJ. Shout out to Lil TJ. Just, just a little summer bop. Make, make, make you feel good. A little summer bop. All right, boys. Well, we will see you guys at the same corner, same time next week. Already, I'm going to Denver on Wednesday. I completely forgot, so I'll come back well rested. You're almost a Denver resident at this point, man. I know I got to mm. claim taxes there if I spend yeah. more time there. Mm. We'll Can't see you afford those next taxes. Week. It's Memorial Day next Monday. Might have to change Dan, plan. We'll figure it out. Dan, um, real quick, uh, you, you always you I, you have to do it every year, and I think I, I get as angry as you. The difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Uh, Memorial Day is. Come um, on, Nick. Are you kidding me? Is, is no, no. It says that, we that have to go through this every year. That that passed in war or in conflict. Uh, Veterans Day is celebrating anybody who was a veteran, whether they were, a, a, you know, alive or, or not. So all veterans versus those that that passed. Yeah. So don't country. text your uncle. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your if your uncle served in a war and is still alive, yeah, don't yeah, text yeah. Don't, yeah, don't, don't no need to text him. Happy Memorial Day. Um, but just a you know, a nice little lesson for you, Nick. Well, not for me. <laughs> oh, just for the fan base. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. You you are I, I don't know if that's a question a lot of our fans were wondering, but I appreciate leaving that little nugget of uh of excellence. Shout out to me last week. I uh, went 29 for 30 on the first round of Jeopardy. I didn't even watch the second half because I got I had to go up on top, you know. Mm. 
nerd alert over here. All right, boys. Okay. Same course, Andy same time next fact. week. Spending a lot of time. <laughs>